to do the thing with the stuff. We're going to do the thing. Thing with the stuff and the guy. And the other guy and the other guy. All the guys. All the guys. And you guys. I don't know why. I had the same levels as when we were in the room, but we're peaking. I guess it's because we're on stage. I'm peaking? Yeah. But it's just, I'm just adjusting the levels. One, two, three. Hey. 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 All right. That's about right. I can live with that. Hip. Hey. Okay. No. I got a feeling that love is here to stay. I'm just saying, one of us wore our .NET Rocks shirt today. Yeah. The other yeah. one yeah. is trying to be normal. You know, I mean, yeah. that, you, that could be .NET Rocks. Yeah, no, there's no know. way I would ever take a, I would ever go there. I don't know what that is. Yeah. It's not a no mollusk. explanation. Com. We had this conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the one on the little plant thing in the hotel bar, and you're just like, yeah, no, oh, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not scanning no, that. Thanks. No, thanks. Oh. Nope. Did you see the, the he's got the bio, he, we've got Mark's old bio that says he's 30 years old in hexadecimal, which is awesome, and also incorrect. That is uh, the sign of a bad bio writer. There you go. That's Somebody who says he's, he's like, is he 32 in hexadecimal years. now? The screen's gone blue. Well, it's a sad screen. Hey, boys, if you want to turn that projector off, feel free. I think we're done. Ah, you read my mind. You're so smart. All right, so thank you for being here. This is a live recording of .NET Rocks. Anybody heard the show, .NET Rocks? Ooh, lots All of All right, hands. for those of you who haven't, you have some homework. You have 1,700 and... 92. 92 episodes to go listen to on the flight. Yeah. Good luck <laughs> with that. Uh, this is a podcast that I started in 2002 before the word existed. I called it an internet audio talk show for .NET developers. It's not just all about .NET, but we try to talk about things that .NET developers would find interesting. Sometimes that includes Richard talking about things like electricity, nuclear power, space, space, space. yeah, space. and other things. Uh, so it's it's just a good show. We we have a title for every show, but we always go off on tangents. So. If you're smart, you write code, you'd probably enjoy the show. Uh, one thing that we like to do when we're recording live in front of an audience, that's you, is uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to kick off the show by saying, hey, in this case, Porto, it's .NET Rocks, and I want you to scream as loud as you can, get, stand up, pick up the chair, beat the person next to you, take off all your clothes, and run around, set fire to the building. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. That's the kind of loudness I want to hear. All right, you ready? Because we don't have you mic, so it's going to come through. It, it yeah, has to come I'm, through these little things. And I'm actually going to have to take this off when I do this, yeah. because otherwise it's going to go. Uh. <laughs> All right, you ready? Ready. You ready? Yep. Hey, Porto, it's .NET Rocks! Yeah. <laughs> Some guy actually picked up his chair. He was going to beat the person next to him. <laughs> the guy beside him didn't even flinch. It was amazing. Richard, it's been so long since we've been in a crowd oh, wow. in front of 40,000 people like this. Yeah. No, my, my, my stadium experience has waned. Yeah, mine too. It's been a long, long time since we've done a live show. So you guys are the, the first to have us back. Uh, I'm here, Richard's here, Mark Rendell is here, and we, uh, we're going to kick this show off as we always do with a little segment that I like to call Better Know Framework. Play the music. Okay, well, welcome to recording a show. Now you know the lie that you never hear the music when we record it. No. We insert it after the fact. Whenever you hear us talk about how funny the music is, that's also a lie. That's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> we don't hear the music. We know what the music sounds like. We've heard it a few times. But yeah, it doesn't get inserted in the show. And this is all an edit point. And we're going to have a few of them over the course of this hour. Yep. None of which will appear in the show. You'll know the truth. We only sound as smooth and, cl and, and coherent as we are because we have editors. One they, in particular. Yeah, Brandon makes us sound smart. Yep. He but, turns up the smart and turns down the suck. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Brandon does. Thank you, Brandon. Everybody oh. say, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, thank you Brandon. Brandon. Although he only does it for those two. Yeah. So they let me sound as stupid as I am. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
We are perfectly willing to have you destroy your career on our show. Oh, yeah. Right. All right. You ready like, to come in? Like that would ever happen. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. All right, buddy. What do you got? Okay. So, uh, you know who Peter Morris is? Peter Morris is the author of Fluxor. Huh which is a C-sharp implementation of the flux pattern which Redux uses okay. in the JavaScript world to do state management, and, but it's for Blazor. He has recently also done one that is for .NET in general that is not specifically for Blazor. Cool. Called something else, uh, but me being a Blazor developer, I was really interested. So I got to know Peter. He's one of these guys who's just scary smart. And he knows a lot about computer science and patterns and, and things and the way they should be built. Mm -hmm. And he took up this little claim with the uh, .NET team. Now, I don't know if you remember, Richard, but it was back in episode, an unhandled exception has occurred, reload, <laughs> that episode. <laughs> I know that episode well. You know that episode well. All right, here it is. Hang on. Hang on. No, I don't know. All right, edit point. So back in a previous episode, remember I was talking about the immutable collections and sure. immutable arrays and all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? And I found this, and I thought this was great because an immutable collection is something that you probably want if you're on the server side. Um, I've always had to lock them yeah. before I access them, as yeah. you have and everybody yeah. else. But immutable collections and immutable arrays sound really good to me. So he was doing some digging into immutable array of T and he found out that it was really effing slow. Hmm. The reason is, is because it does not do the standard immutable pattern when you, it actually does have an add method, Yeah. but when you add to immutable array of T, it copies the whole array oh. into a new memory structure, right? So it's, it's quite non-performant, and he took this up, and I'll, I'll link to the GitHub repo where, mm -hmm. where he's bringing this up. And they suggested he uses uh, immutable list of T because mm -hmm. that's much faster. And he was like, well, okay, but why do you have an immutable array of T with something that lets me add? Because people will naturally assume that arrays are faster than lists. Right. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but they will assume that because it has an add uh, method, I should use it. And the, the team came back and said, yeah, well, it's really for uh, read-only data. It's really for you should, you should make something an immutable array of T once it's set in stone and then just read from it. And he said, so why not call it a read-only array of T right. <laughs> and remove the ad? And basically the answer was, oh, we couldn't do that. That would be too disruptive to our customers and whatever. So I thought it was a really interesting discussion. And they went at it. You know, it was, it was kind of a really dramatic. I mean, we all need drama as developers, don't we? <laughs> because we live in such a non-drama world yeah. that when we see people like sparring over, over memory, it's uh, exciting. Yeah, that's I mean, what every GitHub issues, what every GitHub repo needs is more fights in the issues. Absolutely. You know, there's not enough yeah. of that sort of thing going on, especially and, not in the .NET world. And, and, you know, it would be better if there were, like, British rules. Because when Brits fight, they're very polite. Yes. <laughs> Marquess of Queensbury rules, yes. yes. You but, hit me, then I'll hit you, and we'll see who gets tired first. Yeah, or you could do, like, this Scottish shin-kicking kind of thing. That is a thing. It is a thing. It and is a thing. And you know what they say when, they're, when they've had it? They say, sufficient. Yes. That means I'm done, you win. Yeah. <laughs> sufficient. Anyway, I thought it was a really interesting conversation, and the take-home for you guys is you probably don't want to use immutable array of T. And even though I was talking about that in a previous show, you might want to think about using immutable list of T because it's more performant. Right. Yeah. It does what you probably want it to do. I'm still reading these ongoing comments. I mean, up to like... It's amazing, huh? Yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's basically saying, you, you know, you say it's immutable, but according to the laws of immutability, you're not implementing the patterns that should be implemented. Instead, you should call it read-only, and they basically say, no, nanny, nanny, boo-boo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's what I got. That's pretty awesome. Who's talking to us today, Richard? Grabbed a comment off of show 1728, the one we did, last did with one Mark Rendell back in Feb of 2021, like, uh, you know, back in the old days. Uh, the old-fashioned way, too. We weren't in person or anything fun like that. We're doing it on the recording. 
And uh, John had a comment. This was the show we talked about uh, migrating from WCF over to GRPC and, yeah. and all that fun tooling that you've been working on uh, with Visual Recode there, Mark. Yeah. And John's comment was, thanks, Mark, and as always, Carl and Richard. Just watched part one of the web forms migration on YouTube, and it was very cool. The big brang approach of let's recreate the whole thing from scratch, I suspect, isn't often practical or financially viable. This seems like a great best of both solution, allowing people to move forward into shiny new without scrapping all the existing code in the process. Because you never get to do that, right? You no. have to piecemeal across, and, and you presented an option for being able to do that. Mm. Uh, so good for you, John. I'm glad it's working for you. And yeah, good coding stuff for there. So thanks, John, for your comment. And a copy of Music Code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music Code by, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or on the Facebooks. We publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music Code by. You guys cool. didn't think I said that. That's really time, awesome, right? Right? <laughs> Mr. Campbell. <laughs> it sounds the same each time, but I say it every time. Once in a while, I do fumble it, but yes. not today. <laughs> yes. And uh, definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin, and he's at Rich Campbell. And send us a tweet. And when you do, uh, you can go ahead and add, Twitter won't copy itself. <laughs> Immutable of Twitter. Add a tweet. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought it was funny. I did, too. Yeah. So uh, with that, let me introduce Mr. Mark Rendell. Uh, do I need to read your bio? Do you want to introduce yourself, maybe? How, how does um, one introduce Mark exactly? Ex uh, extremely smart, extremely witty, uh, and a problem solver if there ever was one. Yeah, how about that? that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. And, and pathologically incapable of not coding. Yeah, right. it is a problem. Yeah. That's, right. um, yeah, they can... Well, I mean, did, it, did anybody see uh, Mark's talks? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. It, it went on... Like 15 minutes too long. I, I had no. <laughs> I got somebody in the back who held half. I got half it into up. my head that I'd started at 20 past three. Oh, and then at, and at you quarter started past at three. four. And I started at three. And, and at quarter past four, um, Ian Cooper just went. <laughs> now, so was, were, you, were you stretching or were you just in the groove? I have no idea. I'd done the talk like many times before and it always actually goes so you weren't feeling like under. why am i still talking like yeah i don't know <laughs> it's it's obviously the pace of life here in the in sunny portugal it was pretty late just slow like you here. down yeah. and you're just like yeah, yeah. No, so. <laughs> i know roslyn but it's less important this time <laughs> you know a few hours in the sun and a couple of beers it's nap time yeah, yeah exactly yeah so. uh, no this is sangria country friends just drink the sangria you'll be happy yeah a jug at a time yeah so <laughs> What the heck is on your mind these days that you want to tell these good people about? Oh, wow. So many things. Um, so, yeah. How uh, is Visual Recode? Visual Recode, it's, it's kind of ticking over, and um, I'm working on some new features for it. I'm working on making it less clever. Oh, it's, um, it's too clever? Well, it tries to be too clever, and then when it fails, what you're left with is just a mess. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking it down. Take, sort of, it does this, which is clever, and then it does this, which is clever, and then it does this, which is clever, and then you put them all together. Sort and of so, more um, staged cleverness? Yes. And, and if you weren't listening, Visual Recode will bring your WCF services to gRPC services. Yeah. That's what it does. Um, so, yeah, WCF not supported on .NET 6. Core. Or Core 3.1 yeah. or, five, you know, they're, they're done. Microsoft are done with WCF. Right. Um, which is right, because WCF is the .NET way of doing SOAP. And SOAP is 2006's way of doing web services. And it's not 2006. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we should move on. GRPC is now the way that everybody does what SOAP used to do. But, but Mark, I love my WS star standards. They make me happy. No, you don't. No, nobody loves. No, actually, nobody no, there, does. there are people who do. Yes, but um, they all have Stockholm syndrome. Yes, yes, they do. A Ingo Rammer likes it because it made him a lot of money. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and all the, the house. Um, all the but you know, people kind of go, "Well, how does GRPC do WS cryptography?" And you go, uh, "HTTPS." Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Oh. It's Full using stop. TLS. It, yeah. That that is doing the cryptography. How does it do security? Well, it uses tokens. Um, how does it do? 
this, that, and the other. And the answer to all the other how does it do these questions is generally faster and with less CPU cycles. Right. Yeah. So, and, um, and, and I should define gRPC. It does not stand for Google, for Google Remote Procedure Calls. The official documentation, even though Google created it, is gRPC stands for gRPC wrote pr remote procedure yes. calls, of it's, course. It, the, it's self-referential. Yeah, self uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a recursive acronym. Yeah. Um, the G definitely doesn't stand for Google. Although Google created it, it's now open source. It, it is open source, it always yeah. was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it started as the way that microservices could communicate to each other in, a, in the fastest the fastest yeah. way possible. So it actually started out inside Google, and they used it for communicating with their whole MapReduce algorithm and all that sort of thing. Um, and it was called Stubby. And it's a good name. It's I a like great it. name, because the things that you generate on each end are called stubs, right. and you talk to the stub, and then that turns it into a network call. Um, but Stubby was pure TCP, and they handled all the framing and everything. Yeah. And then HTTP2 came along, which was also Google, because that was SPD wise, yeah. um, speedy. And all the speedy. multiplexing and the streaming and all the things that they'd sort of handwritten for Stubby was built into HTTP2. So they went, right, let's rewrite Stubby on top of HTTP2. Um, and then it's kind of like, now that's, that's much simpler and we're much less ashamed of the code, let's <laughs> open source it. So they did. And then gRPC <laughs> web is a little bit different than gRPC, oh, right? Yeah. So yeah. everything can talk gRPC except browsers. Um, and, but you know, browsers, they're not an important part of the network. No, nobody of uses important. those things. No, yeah. Nobody cares about browsers. Yeah. Um, no, it's interesting. So HTTP2, uh, as a specification, there are things that you have to implement, and then there are things that you may implement if you feel like it. And, but you can be HTTP2 compliant without implementing all the things. And one of the things that you don't have to implement is uh, trailers. So HTTP2 has headers that go before the body, but it also has trailers that go after the body. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, one There's of the things there somewhere I there is it. Get it. <laughs> I, 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 I'm something about I thought the trailers came before the main feature. Yeah, right. That's true. Oh, no, why, then they, why are they called trailers? Terrible. Why aren't they called? They should be called headers. Headers. And, and, yeah. And yeah. Now the headers. Um, Bumpers. But uh, so browsers don't have support for trailers. Um, and interestingly, IIS doesn't have support for trailers yet. So the IIS um, web server engine doesn't support HTTP2 properly. Wow. Um, but but nobody, anyway, nobody uses that so either. gRPC web is uh, it's a proxy that sits between the browser and the gRPC service and uses, I believe it uses WebSockets and it turns uh, gRPC into WebSockets so you can use it from the browser, which for almost all gRPC implementations, you have to use this uh, proxy which is written in Go and you kind of run it in a container in Kubernetes or something. But in .NET, because we're awesome, it's mm. middleware. And so you can say, use gRPC web and then use gRPC in your sort of configure app. And interestingly, um, and it just does it all in process. And it doesn't slow things down like you might think. You know, no, it well, doesn't. It's using port 80. Yeah, but it's, it's still using the binary proto buff protocol. Right? Yes. Yeah, it just yeah. sends it over WebSockets and then. And on the browser side, there's a kind of JavaScript library that can decode yeah. the product of buff and it's kind of like turn what it into WCF that. wishes it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What remoting wishes it? Remember remoting? Anybody here old enough to remember remoting? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll books. have a beer after. I'm sorry, we will have uh, some port. I have later. half a dozen feature requests to add uh, .NET remoting conversion to Visual Recode. Yeah. yeah, as well. Wow. To so convert .NET the, remoting to gRPC. You've got customers out there that want to move off remoting. Off remoting, yeah. 20 years later. Yeah. Binary formatter, yeah. man. Yeah. It, uh, you know what? It was stinky fast. And it was, it was. If you were, If you'd gotten uh, Byron remo remoting working for your app, and then they were back then when they were offering SOAP and the WS Star stuff, you're looking at this going, are you kidding? Yeah. Are you insane? And then they said, hey, insane. we're moving to Linux servers. And you're like, oh. Yeah. 
dot. No, but yeah. so the dot net remoting, um, it kind of made its way into WCF because that's where NetTCP came from. Right. Yeah. And NetTCP was super fast. But the problem yeah. with NetTCP is it only worked with .NET, and .NET remoting only worked with .NET. Mm. And so if you wanted the super fast binary and, and two-way communication and everything, then it was C-sharp to C-sharp or C-sharp to VB.NET or whatever. Yeah. Um, and if you wanted cross-platform, which in 2006 meant and Java, then you <laughs> had to use SOAP. Um, these days, gRPC, it's C++, Java, Python, uh, C-sharp, Go, Swift, Kotlin. Co yeah. There's a separate Kotlin wow. that isn't the Java one. Wow. Um, Rust has an implementation. One of the things I think is really nice is Microsoft uh, re-implemented gRPC on top of ASP.NET Core and Kestrel and, and all that super mm. sort of optimized stuff. Mm. Um, and so Microsoft's .NET version of gRPC is kind of joint fastest with the Rust implementation. Wow. Um, and they are both just head and shoulders oh, yeah. above the next fastest one, which I yeah. think is Go. I um, did a performance comparison today in my talk, and gRPC just blows everything away. Yeah. Whether you're streaming or just retrieving data or sending data, it's just yeah. so fast. And it's, kind of, it's essentially it's doing the same thing that NetTCP was, but it's a standard, which yeah. means it works with all the things that you might want to use today, unless you know you're still using COBOL. And it works uh, on every platform. Yes. Yeah, it does. Kinda it works nice. on Linux. Works on Mac. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. With any language. I mean, I, 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 as soon as you said this, you know, oh, you got to switch over to SOAP. It's like I'm pretty sure I used like the Genie library for ActiveX to keep my remoting running <laughs> and still talking to Java. Oh, okay. Done. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't that's, a dark time. That's some but bold it, pain. At right least there, I didn't right? have any XML in my life. Yeah. That was back at a time when I knew that DCOM, the D actually standed for dumb. The, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, I think we covered uh, gRPC and, the, and that tool. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about modernizing your applications. And, you know, this is a yeah. one way you can modernize the infrastructure. That's, but, uh, that's one way. Um, but yeah, .NET, uh, and it's really confusing to talk about this. So when I say .NET, I mean version 5, version 6, really? what .NET Core turned into. Mm -hmm. When I want to talk about the old one, I'll say .NET Framework. Yeah. And so .NET has a problem, um, and the problem is that .NET Framework is too good. Yeah. yeah. I and think. never going away. And never going away. Yeah. The um, Windows has dependency on 4.8. Yes. And it'll never go away. It's, you will it, always have it. And you can't, you literally, you cannot pull that rug out. Right. Because there are probably trillions of dollars a year yeah. going through .NET framework systems. Yeah. And you go to those companies and you say, hey, you really should upgrade to .NET 6. Mm -hmm. And they say, why should we? Yeah. We're right. shifting trillions of dollars a yeah. year. Our and it works. Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you go, oh, it could be faster, or you could use fewer resources, or, or any of this sort of thing. And they just go, yeah, but you know, we're, we're doing fine. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. we, don't, we don't want to do this. We, we buy new servers every other year, and things go faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and, and also faster, people usually respond well to faster. Okay, so then they go, I'll load up my 4.8 and 6 because you said it'll be faster. Then they get a bunch of problems and go, well, this is not faster. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not that it, because it, it isn't running. It's yeah. not that simple to move it, from 4.8. It in. crashes faster yeah. because it turns out that this NuGet package that we took a dependency on in 2009 yeah. that was, you know, that XKCD cartoon of the entire modern yeah. internet yeah. and open source project that some random dude in Nebraska has been that's maintaining. Right. Yeah. Um, and he can't get support until he comes home and, from school. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, but you know, that guy, he wrote that NuGet package and he published it and you took a dependency on it and now he's gone off and he's working at Facebook or, or doing whatever he's doing. And 
Um, and, you know, he didn't even bother to migrate the code over from CodePlex to GitHub, so the right. source code for that package has now been lost. For reasons unknown to anybody, he decided he was going to use the free obfuscator that came with Visual Studio Community Edition, so you can't decompile it. What do you do? You can't, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, there, so are, what there happens, are challenges. What, you know, back, back in the days of clean code, great book, you know, mm -hmm. and when things were before .NET Core, uh, and they were telling us that we should separate, we should have a layer in the middle of our app somewhere that's just pure logic, right? <laughs> and those who followed that advice are feeling pretty smug right now because they can convert that pure logic to .NET Core and everything else we can worry about later. Yeah. But uh, the people who littered their middle layers with, you know, dependencies to, to Windows on one side, you know, dependencies to um, certain frameworks or, or, or UI on the other side and just merge that all together, they're in a world of hurt right absolutely, now. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they can't convert. They yeah. have to rewrite. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of, the, one of my favorite examples is uh, WPF. So WPF was um, ahead of its time in a lot of ways. Some of the stuff that WPF sort of went, this is how we do things, now shows up in kind of Flutter and things like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it was kind of, so the designer can create XAML and then the programmer can write behaviors that do sort of funny interaction things and all this kind of stuff. Right. And then you write view models and then the WPF binds to the view model and the view model is where all your business logic goes. And, in and a the view model world, knows nothing about WPF. Yeah, it's right. pure logic. It exactly. And in a perfect world, that happens in the real world. And, you know, some of what I do, um, particularly these last sort of few years, is... Uh, I'm, I'm sort of working on Visual Recode, but because I do that, I also get asked by companies to come in and help them review their sort of .NET framework investment and identify the low-hanging fruit. What can we upgrade easily? What can we upgrade more slowly? What's a good approach to do this and so forth? Yeah, there's um, an ancient uh, Irish term for that. It's called unfecking. Unfecking, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, you know, without naming any names at all, I have seen business logic in WPF behaviors. Ooh, wow. Uh, which, which just because you can. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't Thought so, I'd save a few hours um, before lunch. Or, or, or business logic in WPF value converters. So the <laughs> oh, thing that man. takes a string and turns it into yeah. a date. And you're kind of going, why is it doing that yeah. there? The and they go, oh, because our banking system needs it to be three minutes later. Yeah. And he's just going, <laughs> but only on Wednesdays. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, for payroll transactions. It and so it is. The whole idea I mean, of you did convert work. the value. You did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you did a thing to it on the way there. Good on you. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody in, in the expo yesterday, and he was going, is there any way I can trick the C-sharp compiler into using my version of Activity Source instead of Microsoft's version of Activity Source? <laughs> and I'm kind of like, no, there isn't. And there shouldn't be. Yes, and if there was, we should get rid of it right yes. now. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is wrong with you, you sick little monkey? Um, <laughs> you, can, you know, it is open source. Go build your this, own version. Call it evil C-sharp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the kind of terrible thing that happens in, in JavaScript and Ruby where somebody monkey patches. Yeah. Like people, there are libraries that monkey patch date dot now in Ruby and make it do something else. <laughs> it's kind of like, no, that, that's, that's it's just, really it's clear really what evil. date dot now should do. Yeah. It should return the date like no. now. <laughs> you can't make that better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but so wherever those levers are where you can make .NET do things that it's not really supposed to do, people will have pressed those levers because that's what people do. And that, you know, we, so a lot of these trillion dollar systems that are shoving all this data around, they're, mm. they're these houses of cards. Right. And you, they don't have any idea which one of those cards you might be able to slide out without the whole thing just coming crashing down. And not down. just that, open, that thankless 
guy in Nebraska. They, exactly. They are the thankless guy in Nebraska who didn't know they were the thankless guy from Nebraska. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They just built a thing and then they moved on and they yeah. haven't thought about it since. Yeah. Mm. And, and you know, there's people using it. And it works. And they're making trillions of dollars. Yeah. Can I have some? Yeah. No? Please. Okay. Never mind. If I break this for you, maybe you'll be more right. Yeah. So the, the first step in modernizing a .NET framework application is to make that clear demarcation of logic. Um, that can be converted to .NET Core. Yeah. And pull it out of wherever yeah. it is, move it into some, you know, new yeah. models or whatever it yeah. is. But. So that, and that's, uh, it's an exercise that um, pretty much every enterprise application, every large scale application, whether yeah. it's .NET or anything else, should go through is, is that cleanup phase. Right. Um, because the other thing you see is, a class that started out and someone went, um, okay, so we're going to create a, a transaction class. And then someone went, well, the invoice is kind of part of the transaction, so then you end up with all the invoice functionality in the transaction class, and then you end up with all the payment functionality going in, and then you end up with these classes that are tens of thousands of lines long. Yeah, as soon as um, general.cs. Yeah. Exactly. Or, 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 yeah. or yeah. even worse, oh. general.aspx.cs, yeah. because they just <laughs> threw it all in the code behind. Yeah. With the one method, do stuff, do stuff. Yeah. and an XML yeah. parameter. Um, <laughs> and... I mean, so I had a... You're laughing because you've you, seen you're it. Yeah. You know that person. You know I that met guy. them. I had oh, wait, a bug it report. Was me. I had a bug report on Visual Studio, uh, Visual Recode. Yeah, I totally, yeah. I've skated over that branding thing with Microsoft there you so go. far. Don't ruin it now. Um, Visual Recode, somebody reported as a bug. So when it pulls bits out of your WCF application to put them into a .NET Core application, mm. I thought, I know it will be really neat. I can actually work out which classes you need, and I can only bring the classes that you need across. Hmm. Um, rather, so, you know, because in a lot of cases, the WCF application is in the same solution with 500 projects as the web forms application and the MVC application and the WPF application and the Windows forms application. Sure, They're all not? in there together sharing libraries and stuff. And so I'm just going to grab the, the actual classes that you're using and bring them across. And I'm going to put them all in classname.cs files. Mm -hmm. And that got reported as a bug because in this person's solution, all the classes were in one file, <laughs> which was called classes.cs. Yeah. Um, I don't get to see the code, but I do get to see the metrics on the code. It was uh, it was the kind of file where even if you just opened it in in Vim, Vim would sit there and go yeah. get the 64-bit version. Yeah, <laughs> hang on, I got some um, stuff to open. Yeah, I, I mean, I did that when I was just starting programming, yeah. but I yeah. soon learned that that was a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. But, 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 you know, anything that but the guy's going, I've got all these files. And I'm kind of like, yeah. And that's a problem because now you can like get to each of your classes just by clicking. Anyway, so yeah, anyway. Can't you just like, if you find a class that's being used, copy the whole file for that class with mm. everything else that's you there know, as well? Programmers just need mental like, yeah. models for things. And I think that's why we get stuck with these paradigms sometimes. Like, putting everything in one file, because they think to themselves foolishly, oh, at least I know where everything is. Well, yeah. no, you don't. No. You're, you're, you're counting on search, you know, yeah. find, to find stuff where, you know, the file system has a find. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just Studio thinking about, you know, find. any modification means updating this monster yeah. class. It's like the yeah. big ball of goo problem. Yeah. And... Um, you, you kind of know that uh, that there's no source control happening there, yeah. and it's probably just that one dude maintaining it. Yeah. Because and that he, one, the, he knows the where stuff is. Conflicts you would get if you had more than one person working on that He's one. Got all file the versions at the same copied time. nicely in named folders. Oh yeah. That are alphabetized and oh, by yeah. date. And and probably With sort of every previous version of the code is in there, just commented oh, yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm going to interrupt for one moment for this very important message. And we're back. It's .NET Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Hey, yo. Talking to our friend Mark Rendell about all of the horrors that you find digging through old code 
Yes. In this effort to modernize. And, and why that makes it difficult to modernize. But, you know, it is easy for us to stand up here in our ivory tower and point out, you idiot, you idiot, you idiot. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to offer some solutions for unfecking, yes. as my Irish friends would say. Yeah. Um, um, and so the thing we talked about the last time I was on uh, with Cocoon and the strangler fig pattern, mm. um, and I think for... Uh, for web development for sort of web forms. I am currently working with a customer who has uh, an ASP net application, except I didn't even know you could do this. It's got classic ASP pages in there. Wow. Oh yeah. So they had an um, updated from 1997. Yeah. And it's obviously still running on IIS. And it's running on yeah. IIS. It runs in Service Fabric in Azure, but it runs on IIS in Service Fabric oh, in man. Azure. Um, and uh, I had to change it. it. It had kind of just standard cookie-based login. Um, and one of the things I've just done for them is a centralized single sign-on um, identity server mm -hmm. implementation. And they went, right, cool, now make that log in with that. And I'm kind of like, I'm not entirely sure <laughs> how I can go from an OAuth JWT token to being able to tell the classic ASP page yeah. that the user's logged in. What's that? Oh, you just put the user object in session. Cool. <laughs> all right, then. Um, sure. And so I did all this. Uh, and at no point while I was doing this work had I actually tried to build the code. Because to build the code, you need BB6 installed. Of course you do. Because the classic ASP pages are not really clever classic ASP pages. They're just classic ASP wrappers for con components that mm -hmm. are written in VB6. Right. So, yeah. And, and this is the kind of thing that's out There's there. There's all sorts of problems here. All yeah. sorts of problems. Yeah. So this is the situation where you just go, you know what? Spin up a completely new empty web application in ASP.NET Core yeah. and put YARP in it. And when it, when it starts off, it's just a reverse proxy. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And can, so... Can you uh, explain reverse proxies so to... Basically, you get a, a request, come, an HTTP request comes into this shiny new application um, and it goes, I don't know anything about that, but I've got this address for another server that I am the proxy for, so I'll just send that request straight through to there. That server will serve it. It'll send me the result back here and I will just pipe that back out. It's literally just, just a pipe of the request goes this way, the response goes that way, and it doesn't do anything. But you can then get that reverse proxy to do other things. So you can get that reverse proxy to do the authentication step, and then maybe add those as headers to the request, and then send that to the backend service. That hmm. sounds like a proxy. What makes it a reverse proxy? It's a reverse proxy, I don't know. It, it sounds it's, like a proxy. It's It's because it's proxying Backwards. Yeah, into the it inside. Proxy. So, right. yeah. Okay. Um, so, a proxy would just go, I will stand in the way and I will do this for you. A right. reverse yeah. proxy says, I will stand in the way, but then I'll ask you to do something and you can do that there. All right. And so, Microsoft have created this insanely high performance uh, reverse proxy, which is a library for ASP.NET Core called YARP, which is yet another reverse proxy. <laughs> and it's actually called that. It actually made it out into the world. Yeah, normally, you yeah. don't get that cool of a name from a Microsoft. They, no, That's they tried calling it, so they tried changing it to Microsoft.ReverseProxy, yeah. and there was such a fuff, uh, kerfuffle in the GitHub um, the repo that just went, cha Yarp. we're yeah. changing it back to Yarp. Yeah, leave it alone, um, it's perfect. But yeah, um, but what you, what you can then do is you can go, okay, so if we've got kind of uh, slash account, where you go to manage your account, if I add a, a controller action or a razor page or a blazer page or something to mm -hmm. my new ASP.NET Core application that matches that slash account route, mm -hmm. right. then it hits that and it doesn't proxy back anymore. Right. And so I can just replace the account page. Mm -hmm. And so that is a step on the way. And then 
what you were saying about extracting the logic and, and yeah. sort of unpicking the logic from those ASPX code and behind the com pages components. Oh and the God. com components and, and you know, re rewriting those things. Um, but you can sort of do this a bit at a time. You can say, okay, I'm going to take the logic out of here and I'm going to turn it into a standalone business logic component right. and then I'm going to put that into a, a new .NET application and I'm going to get it to build as, as .NET 6 and I'm going to take out references to binary formatter because that's deprecated and all this sort of stuff. And so you're, you're sort of gradually moving the code, mm. the, the business code, into your new application and you're redoing the UI using Razor or Blazor or, yeah. or whatever you want to use. Right. And, and you can continue to add value at the same time. And yeah. you can say, okay, so um, I, I, can, I can improve this page. I can uh, improve the functionality here. I can make this page interactive mm -hmm. and make it call an API or maybe redo it using Blazor. Yeah. Um, and just and pay off technical debt whilst at the same time fixing bugs, fixing yeah. problems, adding value, yeah. um, and, and eventually getting to a point where you don't need IIS running in service fabric in Azure extra large instances, mm -hmm. and you can run the whole thing in sort of three, um, two core Linux containers yeah. um, and run it on ARM. Right. And, you know, let's save the planet as well. Why not? Yeah, why not? Yeah, reduce, you know? it. Um, reduce the, the total processing power necessary to do any of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Which we have to do. The mm -hmm. percentage of the world's carbon budget that's going on IT is something like 20% at the moment, but it's projected to ri rise to 80 or 90% by 2050. Um, yeah, I want to get more we, dollar per transaction calculations in place so that you, yeah. so you can see some clear ROI of when we execute this more efficiently, yeah. it actually costs us less. Yeah. You know, Bill, uh, at least that's with, with something like Azure, you're, you're being billed for the compute utilization. So yeah. those numbers yeah. are meaningful. But um, I mean, I've seen systems that were running on uh, .NET 2.0, 32-bit, mm -hmm. running on hardware that was probably pulling a, a kilowatt. Right. Um, where and I was, I, I was looking at their performance metrics, um, and from what I remember, I'm pretty sure I could run that today on a Raspberry Pi four. Right. Um, and you know, as long as it was patched into the switch using a gigabit <laughs> Ethernet cable, they could probably do. Um, it. Yeah. And I, I I do wonder how many applications are out there, and people have gone. We need a, a an Amazon like M5 right. to run this and you just think or oh, you could probably run it on like 164th of one of their new Ampere VMs. Actually all of Azure runs on Raspberry Pi 4s. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no that's Google Cloud Platform surely. Sure. Um, but yeah, I've seen those little plexiglass stacks with all the pies in it. Yeah. They um, make whole buildings full of those things. <laughs> But, uh, and I was having a conversation yesterday with, um, so we, we're lucky enough to have a few Microsoft people here, which mm -hmm. is great for, um, for the, the company to, to have them out. And we can talk to them and kind of go, so what's going on and what can we expect from .NET 8 and whatever else? And, and I won't say who it was, but we were talking about um, .NET MAUI. Right. Which of course was supposed to ship with .NET 6. Yes. And didn't. No. And. RC2 at the moment. Uh, it's mm -hmm. RC2. But so there's been, close. they have been scrambling to yeah. get that ready. They've been working hard. Um, yeah. And they, they really bit off. That's one of those things. It's like my social network where I went, I'm going to write a new social network and take down Facebook. Sure. And yeah. it's only going to take me a week. Yeah. Because it only took Mark Zuckerberg a week to write Facebook, didn't it? <laughs> no. Neither of those things are true. No, but, um, but it become, because the problem with anything UI related is it's all edge cases. There's yes. nothing but edge cases. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so now we've got uh, Maui RC2. It's going to be released probably in the next four weeks. Mm. Um, There's a Microsoft event coming up. Huh. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> but then that just means now there are four models for creating Windows desktop applications with .NET. Right. Yeah. If you don't count MFC, which is what the Windows team thinks you still should use. Still uses, yeah. And still use to make Office and yeah. all that sort of thing. What got are the, 
you got Windows Forms. Yep. Yeah. A um, lot of people out there built applications using Windows Forms, very happy to continue using Windows Forms. It still has the best designer. It's, yeah, you know. Um, and then we got WPF. Yep. And that works too. It's, it, there are some issues with it, and uh, it's not the most resource friendly way of building an application, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. Then there's slick. UWP, which really was a false start and it was very heavily tied to Windows 8 um, but people used it anyway and right. so now there's a bunch of stuff out there in UWP and Uno platform have created a way where you can write UWP code and then ship it on iOS and Android and Linux and the web and all this sort of stuff and now Microsoft come along and go hey no .NET MAUI multi platform application user interfaces right um, where with a single project and I mean this is impressive but it is a single visual so a Xamarin cross-platform project is kind of like a, a class library and then an iOS application and an Android application yeah. Maui it is one project yeah. that multi targets four different platforms um, and you, you sort of have to remove Mac Catalyst, otherwise it complains that you're not doing it on a Mac. Um, but now we have four. And uh, if, you, if you've been using Xamarin, then yes, you migrate to Maui, and they're actually creating tooling to help you do that. But Xamarin goes out of support in 2024 or 2025, like that, I yeah. think. Maui I, is the replacement for Xamarin. Maui is the us. replacement for, for Xamarin, but I guarantee you in 2026 there will still be people shipping stuff using Xamarin. Sure, sure there will. Because it works. Yeah, um, and, if, the, and the, if those folks have enough clout with Microsoft, they'll extend the deadline as yeah. they've done before. Yeah. Um, I just learned this week um, doing my latest .NET show video that uh, you, it's not as easy as you think to when you're targeting Windows to and you know start it full screen <gasps> don't don't Shoot. even i'm serious you have to use pragma statements and if windows then yeah and then in interop code yeah. to the windows api to go full screen there's, so there's it's a whole just it's just par for the there. course because think of all the th the targets they have to hit yeah. in order to make this thing work yeah. everywhere everything so it's not all there yet no. but there are solutions but they're like that, and yeah. you only find them if you peruse the GitHub repo, uh, you know, and find people complaining, "Hey, I can't do this," and some engineer goes, "This is how you do it today." Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know, .NET Maui does not produce an exe file right. when you build for Windows. It produces like an Apex uh, and, a, and a manifest, mm -hmm. and so when you press F5 to debug it, one of the steps you'll see is, "I'm deploying it." And it's kind of like, what, what are you, why are you deploying it? Just run it and attach to the process. No, I can't do that. We're creating a sandbox, deploying your app into the sandbox. Then we go into the sandbox and we tell that to execute the thing. And then we hook into that container through an open port. And, we, and you know, you go to a, a Windows Forms guy with that, who's got an application that he's been happily maintaining for 20 years yeah. that does everything he needs yeah. it to it's do. This is before .NET. Right? And, yeah. yeah. And you say, hey, this is the new way of doing it. And he's going to tell you to take a jump Bugger off of... Off. Yeah, why would yeah, I break a, this? Yeah, why? Um, well, and it's not like WinForms is going away. It made it across. To it the, did make to it dotnet. across. It did. Right. Um, with some changes, like it's not a seamless drop over. We're talking so, about modernizing, you know, Windows Forms app is what we're, apps is what we're moving away from. In theory. And I think most people are gonna move to a web platform. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not saying most, I mean, some will, but yeah. you know, the web is very attractive. And now there are tools like Blazor that just you know, are hard to resist. Yeah. In terms of yeah. Pro, uh, um, but if someone's been in WinForms that long, they're not likely to leave WinForms, especially when yeah. there is a current supported library for I, WinForms. I'm doing an update yeah. for a customer right now from a WPF, a WPF app that they run in VMs for their customers. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Yeah. To a Blazor server app. And they chose Blazor server because one, they have, you know, a, a limited number of customers. They're all, very highly pay, paying yeah. customers. But the other thing is that uh, they, they want to just keep their secrets on the server. They don't want to yeah. have to write another layer. Hell uh, yeah. And it's faster, right? I mean, let's think about updating the UI in Blazor server 
It's just a, it's like old school tiny fragments, tiny of, fragments dome. of yeah of, of compressed zipped. Uh, you know, here update that field. Here update that field. Yeah, and just really, whereas what really they're fast. coming from is remote desktop into a VM, right. updating the entire screen sixty times a second. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's going to be better. Yeah. Um, what, what do you prefer? Um, do, would you prefer to talk a customer into Blazor Server if they can? Uh, I I probably would. If they wanted to kind of go, uh, certainly somebody who was using web forms, yeah. I would say to them, Blazor Server is going to be the closest thing yeah. to that development experience where you're not having to worry about the fact that you are an HTTP application, where well, you can just speed. say, when they click that button, do a thing. Go and get something yeah. from the database and and render it into the screen using this, this sort of Razor syntax. Mm -hmm. um, but speed also, right? And, I mean, but yeah, speed. Uh, and and um, never having to worry about deploying uh, an updated version of the application to every PC right. in a 10,000 PC yeah. office. Yeah. Um, Blazor, so I, uh, Blazor Wasm, I'm kind of less convinced that that's, that's the thing. I'm sure it is for, for some stuff and they'll continue to iterate on it and improve it and I think yeah. Wasm is fantastic, yeah, and, and but, like it, can see I, but you're getting very scenario forward. specific now. Yes, we are. Like if if the wire is a constraining aspect, having a, one initial load to the client, which is that big WASM assembly and a relatively small API calls back, that makes sense. Yeah, if you if the um, it, and then the next question is how far is the server from the client? If the latency to the server takes a while, server side can be slower. Yes. Right. But yeah. without a doubt, server side, I think, is simpler. It's easier to update. It is inherently more secure. And I'm going to say it's inherently faster. Yeah. Well, and the well, the main thing is that the server side compute time is reliable. Yeah. You don't know what client you're running on, and so you're going to have some fast clients. You're going to have some bad clients. Yeah. yeah. But you don't have that problem if that's being done on the on the on the server side. Yeah. Absolutely. And then it's just render time, which is still going to be variable. Yeah. But right. not as variable. But yeah. Um, and uh, and Blazor Server, um, I've I've tested it on on different scenarios. I've tested uh, a Blazor Server running on a Raspberry Pi four in my house over a Cloudflare tunnel mm. uh, to my phone. Admittedly, still sitting in my house, but not connected to the Wi-Fi. Right, so going I was going through, through a public network. web address, and I can uh, the phone signal that I get in my house um, is H plus which means you are so far from the nearest cell phone yeah. tower. <laughs> but we do have this, ex this is like infrared yeah. that we're using to communicate with your phone now. Yeah. Um, and it was acceptable. Yeah. The, the performance of this thing was acceptable. And nice. I didn't even have to worry about the fact that um, Safari is, a, is the IE6 of yes, the modern internet. It truly is. <laughs> and we, and you, and it, because it's popular, and not compliant with standards. Yes, yeah. and and irreplaceable on on the device. A huge way the devices. EU has its way. That's about to change. Well, yeah. If, I mean, that's we, right. We, we yeah. shall see. Yeah, we'll see. But yeah, but no. Um, there there are all these different options uh, for for upgrading to .NET um, and modernizing your .NET thing. And if you've got Windows Forms. It's actually pretty painless, yeah. mm -hmm. and if you've got a WPF application, it's actually pretty painless. If you've, um, if and you've, re you know, removed all your logic from behind your button clicks, and no, you know. even even then though. Um, so uh, if you get the .NET Upgrade Assistant, which is an open source thing that they've done, it's a command line tool. Mm -hmm. right. And one of the things I'm actually looking at doing is um, kind of surfacing some of the functionality from this Upgrade Assistant. Because it's a command line tool. Yeah, yeah. right. And you, think try, you try sort of think convert. the people who create WPF and particularly Windows Forms applications have probably not opened a command line in a while in some cases. Yeah, probably. probably. Um, and so I'm kind of going, how can I wrap this in, in Visual Studio extension and Give take credit client, for yeah. it and charge people for <laughs> it? Um, but yeah, take, you can point Instead of Microsoft's product, you're going to take Microsoft's product and make it an extension. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and But yeah, you can point upgrade assistant at a WPF application and as long, 
if you're using like a really old version of Telerix WPF controls or, mm -hmm. or um, component one or something like that, right. then you might have some it's issues fussing. sort of getting the upgrade to go. But even then, when they said Windows Forms and WPF are coming to .NET Core, mm -hmm. I think it was .NET Core 3.0 they did it in, wasn't yeah. it? Um, the Telerik and Component One and uh, and all the others, sorry, Sync Fusion. There we go. Dev Express. Dev Express. Dev Express. Yep. Um, I'll try and name as many as I can. There is one that I haven't named because I don't like them. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know who you are, and you know why. But you know what you did. <laughs> yeah, you know what you did. Um, that was actually their web forms controls, though. So you know. But yes. Uh, they, they did make an effort to kind of go, all right, if you're on the up-to-date version of our control library for your .NET framework, Windows Forms or WPF application, we are going to make it as painless as possible. You will just literally have to add .core or something yeah, right. to the NuGet package names. And um, I think some of them even made kind of tooling to do that for hmm. you as part of that upgrade. Because quite a lot of these control vendors, you don't install them as NuGet packages. You install them in the same way there's a Visual Studio installer. Right. There's a component package installer that does gets you your upgrades and stuff. And so, yeah, WPF and Windows Forms. So that kind of modernization, get that running on the new stuff. And then you've got spans, you've got all the new async, you've got all the sort of high performance things that have appeared in .NET right. and the new HTTP client and HTTP3 support and all these kinds of things. And that's great and that works. Um, whether you're then going to be able to say to those people, okay, so now you've got it and it's fast and it works and it's on a thing that's supported going forwards, now upgrade it to MAUI. And you're kind of like, why? Well, is the UI so, broken in any way? Like, yeah, why did you migrate it. in the first place? Yeah. Well, it uh, has to handle these weird things. Like, for example, a Windows Forms button click event handler, if I remember, has, you know, sender, object sender, yeah. and event args, args, or yes. whatever it is. Yeah. And in Blazor, there is none of that. No. I mean, there's just, you can either do void or async task and button click handler. Yes. That's what, oh, that called. is one thing I love about Blazor. The yeah. fact that you can have on click and you call a method that is async and returns a task. Yeah. Mm. And Blazor will handle that. Yes. Wow. And it's just kind of like, why can't we have that in WPF? <laughs> and uh, for me specifically, it's WPF because I'm writing Visual Studio extensions. A round of applause for Steve Sanderson. Steve, yes. Yes. I, I would also say, with anyone working with, a, with existing code bases, Maui one's not going to be your choice, no, uh, because you know any more than it was any fun moving to core two, yeah, right. No. But core with two the, is pretty good. With but that, three. by core three one and the upgrade assistant, like suddenly it became a lot smoother. The pattern's clear. By the yeah. third version of Maui, this will you will have features that are nowhere else, and there will be an upgrade path that's a lot simpler. Yeah. But Maui but, one, not so much. No, but I, so. so it, but if I could summarize, because I, I realize we, we've yeah, come to the end there. of our time. Um, yeah, the one thing that I think uh, companies, even if you're not planning on modernizing, even if you say you're completely comfortable staying with .NET 4.8 until the heat death of the universe, <laughs> which according to CNN is only 20 years away anyway. Yeah. Or, in, um, if Elon buys or if Elon buys Twitter, then yeah. it's probably tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's just to, to Go and read clean code and read um, the uh, such vintage books. Are you talking about working effectively with legacy code is also an uh, extremely yeah, Michael Feathers. Book. Michael Feathers book is an fantastic. amazing yeah. book. Read yeah. those um, and clean up standard. your code and get get your business logic out of your WPF behaviors and your value converters at the very least. Yeah. But, but they, you know, I'm not saying they have to run in different classes and don't, I'm definitely not going extract everything into microservices because don't, um, but Gen do clean it up. Yeah. From your classes. Yeah. So you can have dummy classes that the UI people can use to mock things, give those to them and while you're working on the conversion. Yeah. Yeah, that's but yeah, just get, get those layers, get that separation in, 
And when you do decide you want to modernize something, or even if you just want to kind of go, we want that functionality, but we also want it in, in our iPhone app that we have decided to build with Mary, right. then you will be able to pick that class up and, you know, compile it as net standard 2.0, yep. create it as a NuGet package, and share that code between your, your web forms application and your iPhone application. And Bob's your And, uncle. you know, right. there's, there's, there's a win there. And hey, maybe along anything. the way, write a few tests. Oh, well, yeah. That, that's crazy talk. That's yeah. just crazy talk. Yeah, that is yeah. crazy. Step too far. Okay. Yeah, yeah too far. That. Too far. I'm <laughs> really right. sorry. Mark, uh, it's been great talking to you. Mark Rendell, ladies and gentlemen, give it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time on .NET Rocks! Yeah.